diagnosis of uh, on the cancer and send, send us your Holy Spirit uh, grant us your gifts of knowledge and wisdom and understanding that we may enjoy the fellowship to me and depart here uh, more fulfilled. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I'm Tom Welch. Thomas Patrick Welch. No, no uh, bias on how, uh, how we have the title here. But uh, most of this comes from uh, Thomas Cahill's book from the Hinges of History series, How the Irish Saved Civilization. We've had other, other sources as well. Um, take a break. Okay. Hello. Should maybe save this for March, right? But we'll do something else in March. Okay. How real is history? The the thing is, everyone has their own perspective. I mean, how we view things in today's environment. Are, are different depending on who you are, who your background is. Um, it's, um, John Henry Newman has a story, and it's about this British noble who invites a lion to his, his, uh, his estate for, for dinner, and they go through the very plush private apartments, and each one is grander than the last, and central theme of all the decorations is how noble a lion is. And it seems that at the end of all of these murals, the lion is always failing to achieve his ends because man beats him. And you know, they go through, and, and the noble goes to the lion, well, weren't you impressed? Didn't you like my homage to the lion? And the lion is, is very grateful. And, it says, you know, the, the decorations and the murals were great. However, I think the lions would have fared better if the artists were lions. So um, the victors, the victors write history, and oftentimes the vanquished disappear from history. So their side of the story isn't told. Um, in, in our case, when the Dark Ages descended upon Europe with the fall of the Roman Empire, literacy, Europe became illiterate. And the only literate people in Europe for a thousand years were the uh, Catholic clergy. There were some nobles that were semi-literate, but by and large, the only people that wrote or could read with any degree of proficiency were the clergy. And there were even priests that were, couldn't read real well, but the, the monks, particularly the Irish monks, were the people who preserved history. And that's how they saved civilization. So um, let's go back to Rome. Rome was the first, last great empire. It controlled the entire Mediterranean basin up through Great Britain, um, one of the largest empires in history. Uh, the border solidified kind of along the Rhine, and then there's a little gap there around Switzerland and then down the Danube. So all of that became Rome, and on the other side were barbarian lands. So the thing that allowed Roman to Rome to have their empire was agriculture. So agriculture provided a degree, degree of stability. They were able to have leisure time to, pers to uh, pursue academic pursuits reading, writing, plays, and general Roman culture. Uh, the barbarians liked what the Romans had. There was the, the worst Roman, the most lowly Roman, would not want to be a Goth, right? But noble Goths wanted to be Romans. So they, everybody wanted to be part of Rome because, you know, they wanted to be on, on the winning side. <clears throat> They had agriculture. They learned it from the Romans. It caused pressure on the, the barbarian side of that border. So 
people trickled across that border and settled within the Roman Empire. The Romans took these barbarians and they enlisted them into the army because not all Roman citizens wanted to serve in the army. So to keep the army up the strength, more and more bar barbarians served in the army. So more pressure from the agriculture, and all of a sudden you've got thousands of screaming barbarians on the borders that want to come across. The Rhine froze solid. The barbarians come across because now they can't defend the borders, and the barbarians in the army, along the auxiliaries along the forts along the Rhine, can't hold them back, and that's how Rome started to, it didn't collapse overnight, but that was the first great collapse of Rome. <clears throat> but it goes further back than that. When, uh, when Rome converted from a republican form of government to a dictatorship, what happened was the insiders got, they didn't have to pay taxes. And the poor people couldn't pay taxes, so the middle class paid all the taxes. And sooner or later, the middle class either became rich or they became poor and there was no middle class. And when they lost the middle class, they lost their tax base and the people that were rich didn't have to serve in the army and the people that were poor didn't have to serve in the army, so they lost their soldier base too. So all of that led to 410, when Alaric the Goth came down to the gates of Rome and said, and you know, was gonna besiege Rome, and the city fathers came out and they said, we'll pay you to go away. And Alaric looked at him and said, tell you what, you pay me and I won't kill you. And he went to the city and he became the Roman Empire. And he, he and his descendants became the Roman dictators until 476 when they eventually fell. So it didn't fall overnight, it was a process. Okay, so what happened when, when Rome fell? You had a society, you had great civic works in Rome, a lot of those were destroyed by the barbarians. The, the way to upkeep things, the, the civil structure to provide law and order, uh, the pan-Mediterranean government, all of that was gone. Um, because they didn't have the stability of the government, there was no law, there was no education going on, so the schools were all closed. The Roman capital moved to Ravenna. Um, that's up in northeastern Italy, um, kind of close to Venice. Okay. Uh, so the Romans weren't, their center of government wasn't even in Rome anymore. So they lost their identity. Um, prior to the fall of the empire, the Roman road network allowed safe, swift travel throughout the empire. You could get on the road with a cart, a horse, and you could travel uh, dozens of miles in a day. <laughs> After the fall, you had highway robbers and bandits, and you couldn't travel, the roads were unsafe. So now, instead of having this large, European-wide um, collective of sharing of ideas. Now you have a group of people within a 20-mile radius sharing ideas. So there's no free flow of information anymore. It's gone. Uh, with the breakdown of trade, the one thing that they could trade with each other were people. So the, the large Roman landholders, uh, they create their people working on their lands became serfs. And they needed more serfs to work the lands. So they started arming their people, capturing and fighting. And this is kind of the rise of feudalism with these former uh, landlords. They're capturing each other's people and selling them to slavery. And so the serfs and slaves are working, working the land for the, the petty nobles. We lost all of the, uh, all the great Roman poets and uh, works of art. Those were gone. And the only people that could read and write and had any, any sway over the population at all were the, the Catholic bishops. The government basically disappeared. 
So he just had the petty landlords, and the only vestige of the central authority was the Catholic bishop. Now, because the roads were unsafe, the Catholic bishops stayed in the large cities with the most powerful noble. I mean, the guy might call himself a king, but he was not a king in what we think of as the king of France, but a much smaller kingdom. Uh, and so that's all, that's all you had for government. There was no central authority. So, uh, Kenneth Mackenzie Clark um, defines it as this. Uh, it's a quote in the book here. I'm not, you can read it. Um, he, he, has, he has an interesting take on, on history. I, do I need to read it? Yeah. Okay. Well, what, what is really lost when a civilization wearies and grows small is confidence. A confidence built on the order and balance that leisure makes possible. Civilization requires a modicum of material prosperity, enough to provide a little leisure. But far more it requires confidence, confidence in the society in which one lives, belief in its philosophy, belief in its laws, and confidence in one's own mental powers. Vigor, energy, vitality, all the great civilizations or civilizing epochs have had them. So, if you don't have confidence in your country and in your surroundings, you can't have a civilization. And there was no confidence in any central authority, therefore you had no civilization. Okay, dial it back, the Celts. Celts were uh, an interesting group of barbarian people. They started in uh, Northwestern Europe. Uh, in pre-Roman times, they expanded the Celtic Empire all the way into Asia Minor, or, which is where Turkey is today. Um, in Turkey, they were known as the Galatians. In France, they were known as the Gauls. Uh, the Iberians, that's Spain, the, the entire Iberian Peninsula were Celts. Um, all of the British Isles were Celts. Okay. Think about the Celtic people. They had a lot of queens and a lot of kings. They, they were general neutral. They didn't care about your gender as far as your ability to rule. So, whereas in, in America, we didn't have universal suffrage until the, the 1930s, the Celts had, had women leaders uh, pre-1000, before Christ. Um, when we had the, uh, the barbarians coming into Western Europe, the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes, which were in the area up by Denmark, northern Germany, they came across the sea to England. And they pushed the Celts out of England into Cornwall, which is the southwestern corner of England, and into Wales. The Picts um, basically pushed the Celts out of uh, Scotland. The, the Picts are a Celtic type society, but not, not pure Celts. Um, they never, the Celts never developed um, into a literate type society, the, the Celts in Ireland. Um, never, never developed writing or anything per se. Um, so what you have is the Romans look at them and say, there's no resources there. The people are completely uncivilized. There's no reason to go there. So if you look at the extent of the Roman Empire, you see in, in, in England, they go up to Hadrian's Wall. They never go to Ireland. There's no reason to go there. It's just not worth it. So the Irish have this moral code. They're the only Celtic society left. Um, and the funny thing is the Celtic um, morals code is still prevalent in 1763 on a grave epitaph where it talks about the man being generous, handsome, and brave because uh, the martial spirit was what was important to the Irish in, uh, in that time period. If you, have, if you have questions or want me to go into something further as I go along, just uh, stop me and we'll do that. Excuse me, right here. 
What's the martial spirit? <laughs> okay, uh, a military spirit. They, they were very, uh, very militaristic. Um, the Irish were always fighting among themselves. So if you think of the Dark Ages in uh, Western Europe, <coughs> that type of petty rivalry is going on in Ireland uh, in the BC times. Okay, so they're fighting each other, and what, what they're doing is it, they're raiding the English coast and the French coast, they're capturing slaves, and their, their society is based on uh, slavery and animals. They're semi-nomadic, they don't have a lot of big towns, um, so, Patricus, we know him as St. Patrick, he was about a 15 year old, he was in England, he was a, uh, a Roman, a Roman uh, citizen, captured, sold into slavery, isolated, they, they really didn't take care of their slaves because they could always go right the coast and get more. In his in his time in captivity, he learned their language, um, developed some trust, and then um, one night he had a vision. Your hungers are rewarded. You are going home. Look, your ship is ready. Now, he doesn't have any shoes. He's wearing a dirty uh, animal skin, and. Uh, He's in the center of the Irish island. Your ship is ready. So he walks 200 miles to the to the coast. He's a slave. He doesn't. I mean, who's going to give him passage on a ship? He goes down to the docks, and he tries to get passage. And the captain goes, ah, I can't can't use you. I get in trouble for having this escaped slave. And then. Uh, he goes into town, begs some food, and the captain comes back and says, I'm short somebody, so I need you to run my ship. So he goes, and uh, they go over, they're taking their cargo from Ireland to the uh, French mainland. Problem is, at this point in time, the barbarians have completely collapsed the Roman Empire. There's nothing there. It's denuded of anything of value, total de desolation. Now, Patrick said that there would be something there. He was mocked, and he goes, God will deliver us. And after he said that, he goes, from the bottom of your heart, turn trustingly to the Lord God, for nothing is impossible to him. Today he will send you food for your journey until you are filled from his abundance everywhere. And I'm like, right. And at that very moment, I heard a wild pigs come, come across the road. So this isn't just food in abundance. This is the best possible food. It is, it's meat on the hoof that's fresh and, and nutritious. And they're like, you're the man, right? <laughs> so... They give him all he needs to, to actually look like a civilized human being, and he goes back to England, to uh, Western England, meets up with his family. He's been gone for you know 15 years. He's now 30, um, and he doesn't know what to do with himself. He's kind of working on his family estate, um, and he has visions and. The visions are calling him to go back to Ireland. Now, he had been captured as a teenager, abused, barely escaped with his life, and then he has visions saying, you need to go back there. <laughs> okay. He, he, because he, he was in his youth when he was captured, he's basically uneducated. Um, but he decides to become a priest, and um, He's ordained, and he becomes the first missionary bishop since St. Paul. We all know the journeys of St. Paul and how he, he brought the gospel to the Ephesians and the Galatians and the Corinthians. Okay, there was no um, missionary bishop between St. Paul and St. Patrick. 
Patrick goes to Ireland, and the Irish, knowing who he was, that you were a slave and you came back here, they respect that because it's just raw courage for him to come back to try to preach to them after him being an escaped slave. Now, we're told that he had a temper, um, but his, his loyalty to the Irish people, he stayed in Ireland and preached to them for the rest of his life. Um, he communicated with, to them at his, their level. I don't know if it's on this slide or the next one. So he died, he spent 30 years there. He died at age 77. Okay. Um, so at, over that 30 years, what he did was um, the Irish economy was based on slavery and animals. He ended the slave trade in Ireland in about 470 AD. You know, 1,300 years before us, whatever. Um, the tribes were in this constant state of warfare before he came. There was no major warfare in Ireland. There were some petty skirmishes, but no major warfare in Ireland until the Viking raids um, in the late, uh, late 900s. Um, I'll talk about the monasteries and convents in more detail later, but he established a lot of monasteries and convents. These were places of education. So he educated the people of Ireland, and they were no longer illiterate. There are legends of him, and I'll go into the three. that None of them can be fully authenticated, but we all know him. Uh, he taught the Trinity to the Irish with the clover. That's how you had the three parts of God all in one plant. Right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit on the three leaves of the clover. Um, <clears throat> the story of the Irish king who um, Patrick walked up to him, he saw Patrick, and he converted to Catholicism, and the entire country converted on the spot. Yeah. Okay, that's probably not true. Um, the vigil fire, we all have the vigil fire on Easter vigil. The tradition is that Patrick started the vigil fire uh, tradition uh, in his ministry in Ireland. And to show how Jesus was the light and he brings light into people's lives. So they had the bonfire and the candle and all of that came from St. Pat. Um, so as Western Europe was moving from this civilized society of the whole Mediterranean basis into complete and utter chaos with no one in charge. Ireland went from complete chaos, warlords, slavery, petty warfare, to a civilized society. So the balance went like this. Tom, yeah. um, you mentioned that Patrick was not educated, and yet he. Well, yeah, he. So when, when did he become educated? So when he when he was ordained. Um, he spent, because uh, he didn't get to Ireland until he was 47, he was ordained about thir age 32. So he had about 15 years there where he actually was educated by the church. But when he was ordained, he was basically illiterate. So in that 15 years, he learned the Gospels and um, he learned to read and write at that time. So yes, thanks. Tom, also you mentioned about the he ended the Irish slave trade. I, I thought you said 470, but he died in 461. So or it must have ended yeah. like 450 or something. Maybe? Yeah, 450. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the pagan warrior virtues of loyalty, courage, and generosity um, pair up with the Catholic values of faith, hope, and charity. So he used, he used their martial virtues to convert to the Christian virtues. Um, if we think of 
back when Constantine converted to Christianity and the Roman Empire converted with him. Um, Christianity gave you Roman citizenship at that time. In Ireland, you didn't get citizenship or respective ability. There was, there was no, no great benefit to the individual. So just as when Paul was converting the, uh, the Gentiles to Christianity, and they had you know, the people of Asia Minor and Greece, they weren't gaining anything by becoming Catholic. During, in the Roman Empire, when people became Catholic, when it was the Roman state religion, people were gaining something by becoming Catholic. In Ireland, they had nothing to gain. So it was, their conversion was very much like the Pauline conversion of the, the first century. Okay, so um, there was uh, the end of human sacrifice. Jews, if, if we remember Old Testament, the Jewish human sacrifice ended with the story of Isaac, right? That's when they stopped human sacrifice. There was human sacrifice in Ireland until Patrick, so um, he ended that. And he introduced the concept to them that Jesus died for everyone, all people. So I mentioned before that Ireland was never conquered by Rome, and that's simply not because they couldn't. It's because it wasn't, sorry, it wasn't worth taking. Um, it was a happy accident that they were, the Irish were evangelized at all. They, they captured him as a slave, he escaped, I mean, and then he came back. I mean, that, that wasn't planned. Um, uncivilized Catholicism, civilized Ireland. Um, and then that literacy that he introduced to Ireland eventually gives the literacy back to Europe. So that's, that's his legacy. They are, if we think of Catholicism starting out, it was within the Roman Empire. So all the Catholics up until the time that Ireland converted were Romanized. They were all part of Rome. So um, when we call ourselves Roman Catholic, it's because we were all pretty much until this point part of the Roman Empire if we were Catholic. <laughs> These were the first people that became Catholic that weren't part of the Roman Empire. Now, obviously, Catholicism is worldwide now, so other non-Roman background people have converted to Catholicism. So we had, we had the 600 years of peace in Rome, or in Ireland, until the invasions. This was, uh, this was a neat thing. The May Day was a pagan holiday in Ireland. Still kind of a holiday. Okay. They preserve that. Halloween, All Saints Day, is our uh, holy day. And I had always been taught that Halloween was something that bubbled up um, and just, but it, about that same time of year, the, the pig, they had an Irish pagan festival. So Halloween descends from that. Ask our Hispanic brethren, and they say that it came. They have they started it. So there's sources vary. The Irish claim to have done that. The, the the monasteries and the convents that Patrick established um, became centers of learning. The Irish people, the Celtic stock, became enamored with learning. So. This, this bled into how they were able, the monastic movement in Ireland was substantial because the only place you could learn was in a convent or a monastery. And so it drove that movement. Okay. Um, Christians were martyred in the Roman Colosseum and have been martyred across the world. There, no Christians were martyred in Ireland until the Elizabethan times when uh, Elizabeth I 
uh, and Henry VIII, those, those folks came over to conquer Ireland and then uh, to make the Irish Catholics Anglican, that's when you have uh, Irish martyrs, but <clears throat> you didn't have any during the initial conversion. Okay, so how, how did this whole thing start? The green martyrs, you've seen the stories of the Irish hermit, these people, uh, they, they go off and they, they crawl underneath a, a precipice under a rock or go out onto some windswept island in the North Sea and they pray. These were the green martyrs. What would happen would be the hermit would be out there, people would go to visit the hermit to uh, get his wisdom, a monastery would spring up because all these hermits now are monks together. Um, it's a center for learning, so it's a school develops, a town develops around that, and so uh, that's how the Green Movement started. The other thing that was happening is as the barbarians are cascading across Western Europe, the learned people of Europe are seeking refuge. Well, they come to Ireland because it's the only place where uh, the barbarians aren't coming in and just, you know, causing chaos, havoc, taking their books, ripping the covers off, because books, books are all hand copied at the time, so they're very valuable. Well, many, many books are either gilded or jeweled covers, and so when the barbarians come, they, they rip the book covers off and throw the books away. Um, so these, these learned people are going to Ireland with their books as a place of refuge. Because of this, Every, every library uh, or center of learning in Europe is burned and destroyed. And the only literate society in Europe that remains is Ireland because you know, they're across the water and the barbarians don't get to them. Um, writing was individual letters until the Irish monks developed cursive so they could write quicker. Um, they spent four to twelve hours a day, depending on the monk, copying books. Most of them were Bibles, but they also copied the books of Cicero and uh, other great uh, authors of the day. What language, oh. language were they in at that time? Um, like so writing? many, many of the monks, uh, they learned Latin, right? So. Um, a lot of these works were in Latin. Uh, some of them spoke Greek. Um, now, if the Irish hadn't been there, the, the great Greek works of Homer and the Iliad, they probably would have been saved by Byzantium. Um, but there were Irish monks that spoke and wrote Greek and copied those works. Right? So, we have Latin, we have Greek. There wasn't a lot of stuff written in, in vernacular other than that, just because <coughs> Greek, Greek and Latin were the, the two great languages of, of the age. The, the Germanic languages, they were barbarians. They didn't, they didn't read or write yet, so there, there wasn't anything to copy there. Um, prior to the Irish, confession was something that you did on your deathbed. You did confession once, a, once in your lifetime. Confess your sins. <laughs> Irish being sinful people had to confess their sins more often than that. So it became a routine thing. And so the, the, the Catholic uh, tradition that we have to do confession at least once a year during the Easter season, that developed from the Irish tradition. Um, there were other things that didn't transfer over. Um, Equality of women, the, the Irish had women priests and bishops. That did transfer over. Um, I'll get to it later. It was at the Council of Whitby. Um, so that didn't transfer over. Um, the Irish had, had some strange sexual practices that didn't transfer over either. They had, they had a time of year where it was, you know, free play, everything goes. Okay. So, 
you have this civilization going on in Ireland where they can read and write, they're teaching people to read and write, they're not fighting with each other, everything's pastoral. In Europe, you have an enclave around Byzantium, Istanbul, Constantinople, whatever you want to call that, that city on the Bosphorus. Um, all the libraries were gone, burned, forgotten. No secular books in Gregory the Great's library. Now, Gregory the Great, one of the greatest popes we've had, his library was considered the most substantial in Europe, 400 books. The biggest library in Europe outside of Ireland has 400 books in it. Um, the bishops aren't out there doing anything with the, the people who are basically pagan serfs in the countryside. They're staying in the big cities because the roads aren't safe. And uh, except for the Irish busily copying books on their island, you have no literate Europe. So St. Thomasil, he's uh, just a follow on to St. Patrick. Okay. He was an Irish noble. He was going to be, he was in line to be king. And he decided to become a monk. But he wasn't just a regular monk. He was a leader among monks. He, he started, he was an abbot very early in life. Um, and the white martyr movement is the movement of the monks. We call them the white martyrs because the Irish monks wore a white uh, cassock. So what they did is they went to reintroduce learning. They started by going just across the Irish Sea to Scotland, established monasteries in Scotland. And um, what they did is, you know, people would flock to these places and they'd grow. And once they grew to about 120 to 150, they'd split and they'd become two monasteries. And so one would become two, two would become four, you know, this geometric pr progression was such that pretty soon, it, and if you ever visit Northern England or in Scotland, you'll see the, the bones of, of these monasteries throughout, throughout that area. Okay. Aidan was a monk from Linsbarren. Linsbarren is a very famous monastery on the North Irish coast. Um, he colonized Northern England, uh, colonized reintroduced learning to him, uh, the area of Northumberland and York, that area. Uh, and from there, the learning spread to Europe. So his, Tom, Tom? Yes. So a couple of folks want to know if they can take like a five minute break. Sure. Are you good with that? I'm fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. St. Thomas Hill uh, started the movement the question on martyrs, they dedicated their lives. They, they weren't killed because they were a green martyr, a hermit, or a white martyr, the, these monks going out, established all these monasteries. Um, so, Camasil Noble basically uh, started this movement where the monks would go and ran our Europe. One of his disciples was St. Columbus, and he was one of the key leaders of the Horde. The Horde being all of those monks from Scotland and Northern England who had originated from the Irish monasteries, came to Northern England, and now they came into Europe. Okay, Northern France. So this guy was in Northern France, established a whole bunch of monasteries. The French lords, they're starting to gel into a larger kingdom type thing that we might recognize. They didn't like the power base that he was establishing and the local bishops. It's like, like he's out here ministering to the people. We're in our cities where it's safe. Why is he out here and no one's messing with him? They say, get lost dude. So it's like, okay, he packs up a bunch of his monks and he starts heading down the Rhine, and if you look at a map of where the monasteries are that he established, it's basically his whole path between northern France to Italy, dotted with monasteries that he founded um, in France, in Germany, in Switzerland, and he finally gets to Lombardy, which is in uh, north uh, northwestern uh, Italy, and he converts he converts them back to Christianity because yes, they were pagan goths at the time, so 
even Italy wasn't Catholic. The Irish reintroduced Catholicism to northern Italy. Um, and a lot of these monasteries were established by the older monks who could no longer keep up with them as he's heading south. So they, they drop out, you know, four, five, ten uh, from his caravan and establish a monastery along the way. So he did over a hundred monasteries that, that he established in his 25 year career as a monk. I mean, if you think about that, that's, that's a lot because each one of these monasteries uh, becomes a center of learning and becomes a town. Okay, the Irish weren't the only ones, okay? And the reason why we still have the universal church is probably because of St. Augustus, St. Augustine. So Canterbury is in southeastern England. Um, the Pope sent him up to England because he was going to evangelize England. They didn't, the Pope didn't know that Irish were over there doing their thing. So as the Irish come down from northern England and St. Augustine's people go north, um, they meet up. Now the Anglo-Saxon converts had, you know, been at war with the Irish um, and had pushed them out of England. So there is historical centuries-old bad blood between the Anglo-Saxons and, and the Irish. Um, and because of this, the, the people from Rome trying to evangelize and the people from Ireland evangelize. Remember I said the Irish had a couple of weird things like women priests and whatnot? Okay. We have disagreement here. This could be a heresy. So they have a council at, Whit at Whitby. Now Whitby was a, a double monastery. It was a monastery and convent. And because it was Irish, the abbess, Hilda, actually was in charge of it. Okay? Yeah, that didn't last either. Um, one of the things was, you know, with all the problems that are happening in Europe, there are two different ways to calculate when Easter is supposed to be. The Irish said, fine, we'll go with your way on Easter, we don't care. Um, and the Irish said, you know what, yes, we acknowledge the supremacy of the Pope. Our, our bishop, uh, you know, from Patrick to Conceal, whatever, he is subordinate to the Pope. And so because the Irish gave in, we have a universal church. They didn't, they didn't try to say, no, we're, we're different. They said, no, we want to be part of the universal Catholic Church. Um, and so... A lot of the traditions, the Easter Vigil and all that, a lot of those Irish traditions and learning that they preserved became part of our faith. But some of the stuff that today we would look at as weird and strange were given up because the, uh, the papists from Rome did not or would not agree with the Irish on that. So the Irish monks did from Northern England to Denmark and Germany. St. Augustine's folks kind of just stayed in England. They didn't, you know, it's like, well, these folks in Ireland, they're doing it all for us, so we don't care. Um, as we go through, we're getting later into time. Charlemagne establishes an empire, um, 700s, right? Um, and he's, he's gotten from France, all the way to Bulgaria is his empire. His, uh, his capital's in Aachen, which is right on the Rhine River. And he, he's illiterate, but he loves the Irish monks, and they teach him how to read. And Charlemagne's eventually crowned the Holy Roman Empire emperor at the end, late in life. But by that time, he's literate because the Irish taught him. And because his empire spread throughout Europe, and he likes the monks because they taught him to read. He facilitates their mission. So when his armies go on campaign, behind him are these, uh, these monks clad in their white habits following his army, converting people to Catholicism. And he uses Catholicism as a way to help govern his empire. So um, <coughs> Catholicism helps Charlemagne command the, the largest empire since Roman times. Um, and it's a, kind of a yin and yang situation. Now, they, when the Vikings started to come and raid Northern, Northern Ireland and, and Scotland and 
Northern England, kind of puts an end to Irish coming out and doing this evangelization. So 793, you know, that that's about the time of Charlemagne's uh, conversion. You kind of have an end of the Irish monastic movement. So the, the Viking raids draw the curtain on the reintroduction of literacy and society in Europe by the Irish, but without them from about 500 to 793. <coughs> that 300 years, they established civilization in Europe with literacy. Uh, so sorry, because I remember, of course, by you, the Nicene Creed in Ephesus, that's right. in 400. So I just wonder, the center of Catholic, I mean, Christianity, and you said the Dark Ages came, but... Okay, so you have the, the Council of Nicaea, mid 400s, right? Yes, there are there were authority the, in the government. Yeah. So with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, yeah. you're, you're talking everything from Concept. Italy, west and north. Yeah. That's all gone. It's all barbarians, desolate, right? The Roman Empire and the center of Christianity really is being led by. You've got the patriarch of Constantinople, God. right? And and he's he's uh, trying to be in charge of the church, but the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, is in charge of the church, right? So you have this going on, and eventually it leads, because of the Eastern and Western Roman Empire, you have the schism, um, and that's why we have Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic. Um, so because the, the Roman bishop, Bishop of Rome, would not be subordinate to the Patriarch of Constantinople. And so in the Eastern Roman Empire, which became Byzantium, they, they established national churches. That's why you have Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox, etc. cetera. Okay. They, they went down a different track some of some of the Eastern churches are in communion with the Catholic Church, and some are not. And at the top of my head, I can't I can't remember which ones are or not. I have to look it up. Okay, but well, according to our priest at Holy Family, who was an Eastern Orthodox priest, which is why he can be married, he said there's 20 to 26 rites of the Catholic. Right. That are in, you know. In communion. Yes. And I assume, from what you're saying, that when it fell apart in the West, they continued on their way. I mean, they right. were so far east. If, <laughs> if you look all at. Kind of, you know, India and all kinds you, of. You could, you could do a whole other topic of, of how that evangelization took place. Right. You've got the, the rivers, uh, the great rivers going up into Russia where all, all that evangelization in Eastern Europe um, and across Asia Minor, that's all coming from Constantinople. Mm -hmm. And when you get to Poland, that's where you've got this meeting of the people coming with Charlemagne's empire, the Irish folk, and the Byzantines coming up the other way. They meet in Poland. So and do they get along OK? No. Of course not. No, it's you know, <laughs> no, they fought over. People, people, they fought have, over people have fought the most stupid wars over religion. It's it's incredible. <laughs> but no, they they didn't necessarily get along. Okay. Thank you. But yeah, they, that's why they they were national churches, and that's why there's all these different rites. So I mean. The Coptic Church in Egypt, that's Eastern Orthodox, the, the Syrianic Church, yeah. Syria. The Moran, the, yeah. The, yeah, so they were way back from the The Maronites, those are all, been there from they, the those, those churches are actually older. Yeah. Um, they were all part of the Catholic Church, and then with the schism between Eastern and Western Rome, that's where you have this. My other, my basic class talks a little bit about that. And Is that like in the about what, 11th century, the schism? Yeah. You, 
Well, no, before that. Well, it happened before that. Eight, eight, nine hundred, eight hundred. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you get this. The, the Eastern Church, the, the Eastern um, Roman Empire, is wholly not pleased when the Pope crowns Charlemagne as the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, because that puts him on par with the, the leader of Rome in Constantinople. And they didn't like that. There were Greek Orthodox churches in Italy during that period of time, and the Pope decided they needed to be Catholic. So he went over and got their church, their churches and told them they had to convert to to his oh, to Roman Catholicism. To Roman Catholicism. And there were and there were other Roman churches over in the Greek area and then they decided to confiscate them. So it was a big battle. Yeah. 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 So they were fighting over who yeah. owned what church. That, <laughs> that's it. I'm ready for another two hours. <laughs>